people are ready for the word of God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Our, our evangelist has been doing a wonderful job. Yes. Amen. 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 Thank you for him. Thank you that his, his wife had been coming and, Amen. and um, helping us, adding that anointing in the scene. Amen. Everything has been going quite well. Yes. And, um, Praise God. He's claimed to be y'all easy church to pray to, <laughs> to preach to. Y'all love the word of God. You know, it's, it's good for a pastor to be able to brag about that. I love telling people that, you know, because I know it's true. So you sure, come on and preach. We love the word of God. Amen. We're, we're hooked on the truth. Amen. So come on, brother. Come and come and add to us. Yeah. So thankful for what I feel in this place tonight. So thankful that he's mindful of us and where we are and what we have need of. And then he saw fit to come and meet visit us in this place tonight. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My, 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 my. There is an anointing in this house tonight. And you have no idea <laughs> how close you were to already preaching my message. Amen. Amen. So I was over there rejoicing, thanking God that here's my confirmation. Amen. Because I know you know how it is. You feel like God gives you a message and sometimes you're wondering when you get into that place. Oh, Lord, help me. And then God will pour out something to confirm. And you were walking all over tonight. And I appreciate you. I appreciate your good pastor and his wife. Yes, thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you again for the invite. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. I wish my wife was able to make it, but... My daughter has been uh, struggling to catch up on her sleep. And she had herself a rough little week. And so she's got school in the morning and my wife said, I am tired of her being cranky. So we are gonna make sure she gets to bed at a decent time that I can get some sleep before school. So she's at home and uh, I know she's praying for me right now. I give honor to my pastor and my bishop. I'm thankful for the men of God in my life. Would not be who I am without their leadership. Amen. Uh, Amen. So thankful for what I feel in this house, and it is an honor and a privilege to be here again with all of you. Thank you for your worship. Yes, For you pull down the power of God. Amen. And you do make it easy to preach. Thank you, Jesus. Without further ado, I'm going to get into the Word of God, and we're going to go into Matthew. Chapter 19, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 23. And before I get into this message, I just want to say, I believe God is getting ready to do some miraculous things in this church Amen. because I felt to preach faith on Sunday night. And I couldn't get away from it in prayer, and I feel to preach faith again tonight. Amen. Praise oh. God. So I believe God is preparing this church for some things that are about to happen Amen. in your lives and in the lives of people that you have been praying for and that you have been witnessing to. Yes. So Matthew 19 and 23. And then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God... All things are possible. Amen. Praise God. And I want to focus on that last verse right there. And my thought tonight is a possibility in the realm of impossibilities. Amen. Praise God. Woo, glory. Hallelujah. 
So with the help of the Lord tonight, I'm going to preach faith into your lives. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now, when Jesus was talking about this, and he was talking about the eye of the needle, when I first got in church, I heard this, and I'm thinking, my goodness. <laughs> there is absolutely no way that a, that a camel is going through the eye of a needle. So it must be absolutely impossible for a rich man to get into heaven. And so I was thinking, how can you live for God and be blessed and get rich and yet make it into heaven? <laughs> but then over time you start studying and you start learning a few things and come to find out that there was an actual gate in the city of Jerusalem called the eye of the needle and it was they say it opened up onto straight street and it was designed for men to pass through and it took a lot of work to get a camel through that gate they couldn't just bring the camel through Usually camels were beasts of burden, so they would weigh them down with all their goods and whatever they were carrying. And so for them to get a camel through that gate, they had to pull everything off. And from what I've heard, they had to make that camel get down on its knees and move through on its knees. That's good. Wow. So it's not an easy thing to get a camel through the eye of the needle. And Jesus knew exactly what he was talking about. And so did the disciples because they, they'd been to Jerusalem and they understood completely. And so... That's what he was talking about. And in some, some people's beliefs, that correlation with the rich man is sometimes rich men are rich because they pursue after their goods. Mm -hmm. And that is the thing that they lust after. Right. And so for them to make it into heaven, they have to mm -hmm. unload all their goods and come through the gate. That's good. Yeah. And so that's what God was talking about when he was telling them that. But what I want to focus on is the possibility in a realm of impossibilities. Now, when we look at Jesus, the very existence of Jesus in the realm of man is an impossibility. Because a virgin should not be able to conceive a child. And when you talk about this to people in the world, it seems like a foolish thought. But 1 Corinthians, I'm going to turn there quickly. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because of the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, now that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the land. And so God said, I'm going to use those things that don't make any sense to confound the wisdom of of the world. Amen. And so he was walking around in the flesh. The almighty God robed himself in flesh. And decided to dwell amongst men. And to walk amongst men. 
And his whole ministry was about ministering the plan of salvation and teaching his disciples about what they were going to bring to the people. And he was working miracles. And it's these miracles that I want to talk about tonight because this is where I believe that God wanted me to go in with this thought of the possibility in a realm of impossibility. So my question is, what are you facing that seems so impossible? And what is it that you have been praying for that seems like it will never happen in your life? I've heard many times since I've come to church, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. And I remember when I first got into church, I used to have vivid dreams that I, un I didn't understand what they meant. And to this day, I wonder if they'll ever come to fruition in my life. And I remember one very vivid dream that I was standing in the middle of a, it was an NFL football stadium, but it wasn't during a game or anything. It was packed full of apostolics God. from the bottom all the way to the top. And there was a stage in the middle of the in the middle of the field and there was preachers there and there was a there was a praise and a worship going up so loud that they were drawing people in from the streets of the city around them because they heard this praise and this worship going up and it had an impact on the city. And I remember standing there in just awe in my dream and wondering, is this possible? Come on now. That's good. And I can't say that I was on the platform. I don't even really remember where I was at in the field. I just know that I was down in the middle. But could it be that maybe one day God's going to pour out a, a mighty move of the Holy Ghost in such a way that apostolics from all over the world are going to gather together in a venue such as that and fill that place with praise and worship. And they will draw in the occupants of that city. And God will pour out a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Because I believe that the great outpourings of the Holy Ghost that we see in the book of Acts. They're available to us today. And when I look at the word of God and we look at what God did while he was walking in the flesh as Jesus. His very first miracle was turning water into wine. And I used to wonder, why God? Of all the amazing things that you did, why was the first miracle that you did turning water into wine? And I used to pray about it. And I remember the day that God gave me the revelation of what it was. I was at work and I was pondering on these things and it hit me like a lightning bolt. God in the flesh in Jesus turned the water into wine at the wedding of some person and the reason that he did that was he was illustrating why he was here because as Jesus Christ walking in the flesh he was the living water Amen. but he was getting ready to become that new wine because he was going to die get buried, be resurrected, and then eventually receive back up into glory so that he could come back down as the comforter and fill us with that new wine. So he was just simply showing an illustration of what he was coming here to do on earth with that miracle. And I about shouted my way out of the building. I couldn't help it. I was so excited when I got that revelation. And so that was the one that I wanted to talk about first because it ushered him into that place of impossibilities and he began to do miraculous works. So he started healing the blind and then the world hadn't seen that before and the Jews had not seen this before. And what that is, is that's a type of Jesus Christ as he walks through the world now through the church because we are the vessels that he uses to walk through the world. We go into dark places where people are spiritually blind and they cannot see. And we shed light into the dark places of their life. And we share with them a word of God. And eventually some of them are healed of their spiritual blindness and their eyes are opened up. And so therefore Jesus in the natural went around healing those that were blind to show us that we are going to walk around in the spirit. And we are going to open up blinded eyes yeah. on a spiritual level. Yeah. He healed the halt and the lame. Yeah. People that had no idea how to walk. 
He healed them in the natural and in the physical to illustrate to us that there are going to be people in spiritual places that have no idea how to walk in this world. They don't know how to walk in truth. They don't know how to walk in the light. But we are going to go in in a spiritual area and we are going to speak words into their life and we are going to be able to heal their spiritual haltedness and they will be able to walk in this glorious truth and in this light. Other things that he did was he interrupted funerals. And he spoke into people's lives and he raised the dead. And as the children of God, when we walk in the spirit, we are going into dark places where spiritually dead people are walking around and they're trying to figure out an answer to their world. And we are we have the opportunity to go in and speak life into their lives and we will resurrect the spiritually dead like Jesus did in the natural. And so in looking at these, there were some that I really really wanted to jump on to and look at. And one of them that absolutely always jumps out at me is Jesus walking on the water. Amen. And we find that in Matthew 14. So I'm going to turn back to Matthew 14. And before he even gets into walking on the water, he did one of his great miracles. He fed the 5,000 men. Now we know that there were, they just counted the men. They said there were 5,000 souls and he, he fed them with five loaves and two fish. Yes. And he looked unto heaven and he blessed it and he broke. Yes. And the thing I love about that story is he started handing out, he started handing out and making sure that everyone was fed. And it was the, Disciples that went and handed the food. That's right. So God gives the man of God the word. Amen. And the man of God takes the word to the people. <laughs> and when God gets done, he got done feeding them and there was enough. There was 12 baskets of fragments left. So every man of God had a portion to himself. So when the man of God gets involved in doing the work of God, God leaves a remnant for the man of God so that he is blessed in the process. And I'm so thankful that when I get a chance to come and share the word of life with someone, whether it be in a Bible study or whether it be preaching to a congregation or whatever it might be, sharing my testimony or witnessing to somebody, I walk away with a blessing in my life because God gives me the remnants of what I just shared with someone in their life and it builds my faith. But what I find so amazing is that Jesus sent them away and they could so quickly forget the miracle. They're in the ship and the ship is being tossed about. Yeah, right. And sometimes we get caught up in life and we're walking after the spirit and we go and we help those that need help. But then we turn around and we walk back into a life that is full of chaos and turmoil because the enemy is fighting you on every front. Right, right. And the wind is boisterous and the waves are boisterous. Yes. And we can so quickly forget that what, what God just did in someone's life. And then we're looking around at our circumstances and we're thinking, God, I'm going to perish. Yeah. I am absolutely going to perish. Come on. Yeah. And Jesus looks down from the mountaintop and he sees them in their distresses. And I'm going to try and pick up where he goes by. Let me make sure I have this right. 14. And of course, I didn't write down the actual verses. I went 1 through 45. I'm going to avoid... <laughs> <laughs> reading all of that. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. So in the midst of all of it, Jesus is walking on the water. Now, water in an elemental state, for the most part, is one of the most stable. 
elements in the world. But you get it moving, and you can't, you can't, we don't walk on water. It's not solid. Right. It's not solid in that sense. And so Jesus is walking on the most unstable element in the world, saying that I've got this thing. You don't have to worry because the unstable elements of your life, I've got this. I am not surprised by where you're at and what you're dealing with. I have dominion over this because I am walking on the top of your circumstance. And you don't have to worry about what's going on around you because I've got this. And so in the midst of all that, Peter, me and the brash and the bold one said, bid me to come. I love his faith. And for a moment, he had great faith and Peter walked on water. But he got caught up in that moment and realized what he was doing and the fear set in. And that's when I believe that he took his eyes off Jesus and he looked at his surroundings and that's when he got lost in the moment and that fear sets in and he realizes he's sinking into that water and he cries out for help. Now God will move on us to go into circumstances and situations where he gives us faith to go forth and boldly do it. And if we're not careful, we get our eyes off Jesus and we look at the circumstance and the situation and we realize I'm out of my element. What am I doing? And that fear can set in. And I'm reminded of a time when I first got in church. I had this feeling. I think I mentioned this in one of my previous messages, how my grandmother hated the church. And I didn't get really into the details on all that. And I'm not going to get into the details of that. But I had a feeling her, her husband, who was my step-grandfather, one of the sweetest men that ever lived in my life. He had a very humble spirit. Well, he was, he was dealing with multiple sclerosis. He lived three times longer than most people that have MS do. I think the average is 15 years once diagnosed with MS. That's the average diagnosis on how long that person should live. He lived for 45 years. Wow. And it was because of the care that my grandmother went out of her way to give to him. Mm. But I had this thing inside of me when I started reading the word of God and I started seeing the miraculous that was going on. And, then, and when it says that you are filled with the power from on high, I have this feeling, there's faith inside of me that says when God said I could be filled with power, that I'm filled with his power. It's nothing to do with me, but I can walk in faith and I can go into places and I can have an impact on people because the God inside of me is the one moving in their lives. And there was something about it that I just... Inside of me, deep inside of me, I wanted to go in and I wanted to lay hands on my grandfather and pray for him. And I wanted to see him rise up out of that wheelchair that he had been stuck in for all those years. Because he had gotten to the point where all he could do, he had a little, they call it a sipper. And basically he would give the commands to the chair by how he would puff on the sipper or suck on the sipper or whatever. And that thing would move according to how they programmed it. I remember when I was a very young kid, he would push that wheelchair around. Mm. But it, it eventually got to the point where his hands, he couldn't move his hands and his arms. And all he could do was lean over and touch that zipper. And all I could dream about in my soul was that I could go in one day and lay hands on him. And he would rise up out of that wheelchair. And I thought for sure if I could do that, if I could just have enough faith and go in and do that. Then it would swing my grandmother the other way and that she would stop hating and railing on because I had family that grew up in this apostolic faith and I grew up watching her badmouth them and tear them down. Wow. And I knew the hatred that she held in her heart for the church. But something inside of me was like, if I can only do that. But when I thought about it, the fear of going into my grandmother's home in faith. Knowing that I'm walking in the very truth that she despised so much kept me from making that approach. And I remember the day when I got the phone call that he passed away. It weighed so heavy on my heart because I was always wondering, did I miss an opportunity? Did I miss a chance? Was that faith measured out to me by God so that I could have faith to walk into a very difficult situation and lay hands on him and trust God and watch a miracle be done in his life? Wow. But because of my fear of how my grandmother would respond, I never went after it. And to this day, it troubles me from time to time. 
because he went into eternity not having fulfilled the plan of salvation in his life. Now it's not in my power to put a man in heaven or hell, but if you don't obey the word of God, I believe you're on your way to a devil's hell. Amen. Amen. And so having never fulfilled the plan of salvation, I don't know that he's going to make it. I can't believe that he's going to make it. Yep. And it weighs heavy on me because there was an opportunity and I let fear stop me. And there are things that I believe God puts in each and every one of us because God said he'd give you the desires of your heart. Yeah, he yeah. And there are things that God has put in each and every one of your hearts yeah. that you would like to see come to pass. And they are, they are church-based goals right. and desires. Right. They are faith-based goals Amen. and desires. Amen. Because that's how God operates. Right. Right. Yeah. Good. And so don't let fear in that moment, when you're working and you're following God and you're following after the plan of God in your life, don't let fear rob you of an opportunity to bless someone else. And in the process, you receive a blessing. Amen. Amen. Because I can tell you from personal experience, those moments when it weighs on you, it weighs heavy. Amen. And it is a burden that you sometimes just can't hardly bear to stand right. or stand to bear and so I want to speak faith into your life and show you some of the things that God has done along the way because God does miraculous things in our lives yeah. every single day. Yes, he does. Right. Sure does. God allows us to go through things and gets us prepared because we pray that we want to be like God. Right. right. And we're going to have to suffer to a bit to be like Jesus mm -hmm. because Jesus suffered greater than all of them. And we can't be our like our master if we're not willing to suffer to some degree. Yeah, right. So when you choose to fast, you're choosing to take on some suffering voluntarily. Right. Right. And so God honors that. So when you fast and you pray, God's like, okay, they're voluntarily suffering because they want to see something come to pass. They have taken an extra effort. And a lot of times God honors that, that prayer. Now, sometimes it takes a lot of fasting. And a lot of prayer. Because what you're asking of them is one of those exceeding, abundantly, above all that we ask or think right. moments. Right. And those things take time. Right. And so while we're sending up vapors, God's working behind the scenes. And he's moving pieces into place. And he's putting things into position. And he's preparing that place that you are going to get into. Because sometimes we're not ready for the blessing that God wants to pour out in our lives. Right. We couldn't right. handle it. Come on. Come on. And so as we're walking with God, God's working on us and preparing us. Because sometimes the blessing, if he gave it too soon, would destroy our souls. Right. Because we wouldn't have the ability within ourselves to handle the blessing. And it might go to our head and we might get puffed up with pride. And all of a sudden, now we don't need God anymore. So God has to make sure that he can trust us with the blessings that he wants to pour out in our lives. And sometimes that blessing that you're asking for, it's not that God doesn't want you to have it. It's that God knows you're not prepared for it yet. And so he's walking with you and he's guiding you and he's working on you. And he's allowing you to get to that place where you're prepared to handle the things that he's about to put in your hands. Yeah. Because he has raised us up to sit in heavenly places. Amen. And he wants us to do a work on his behalf. Right. And as you go through those things, when you first start living for God, they start out as small tests. But you can always count on this. When you pass the test, there's another test coming. Right. It's going to be a little bigger. Yeah. It's going to get you a little higher in your faith. Yeah. It's going to show you a little more of God's glory. Yeah. That's how yeah. God works. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Yeah. Yeah. Here a little, there a little. We can't have everything we want. There are things that 10 years from now I'll be ready to handle. Amen. But right now I can't handle what's, what's coming down the road in 10 years because there are some things between now and 10 years from now that I have to go through personally. Right. And it's the same for all of us. Amen. But we get caught up in this, I want it now. I want it now. Amen. That immediate. I want the immediacy. That's right. But we ain't prepared for it. Amen. Remember one time talking about testimonies of God doing the impossible. We moved into our house. And it had taken everything to put down the deposit. And there was something else that had come up. And we had, we had money and savings. But... 
It depleted our savings getting into the house, getting moved over, and taking care of the thing that we needed. And the first month's rent was due. And my paychecks at the time were not sufficient enough to catch up that quickly. And I remember I was, I paid, I paid my bills that I had to pay, but I always pay my tithe and my offering first. He was talking about paying tithes and offering. You rob yourself when you don't pay your tithes and offering. And what I was taught, I pay on the gross. I pay on the gross and I pay 10% on the gross and then I pay 5% offerings. That's just what I was taught. That's just me. If God moves on me to pay more than I will. But right now I pay 5% on the gross. And I do that because God knew we were going to live in this world and we got to deal with Uncle Sam. And he has, he doesn't care that Uncle Sam gets his cut in there. So right. God gave me right. whatever he gave me as my gross. I'm going to pay on the gross. But when I started that principle in my life, I watched God start multiplying the income in my life. Because the first year I was in church, I made $10,000 of taxable income. I was struggling mightily and I was living at home with my mom because I couldn't pay my car payment and I couldn't pay my child support. And it was a struggle. But I started paying my tithes and my offerings. As painful as it was, I started paying. Amen. And I watched as God started blessing and he started making things available. And so I got to a place where God blessed and I, within eight years, I was making $82,000 a year was my base salary working for Boeing. And it was all because I started paying my tithe and offering. And even when I didn't feel like, cause you go through that test, there's times when you're like, man, I really got, this is really important. I've got to pay this bill if I don't pay this bill. Cause me, sometimes it was, if I don't pay my child support, they may take my driver's license. And when you're sitting there and you're faced with the problem of if they take my driver's license and I'm driving down the road and they pull me over, they yank my car because that happened to me. And it wasn't because of I was being negligent. It was me struggling to find work because we were in a down economy and I was working in the trades. And I went for a couple of months with no work and I watched that happen in my life. And so I didn't want to fall into that trap again because I, I was actually on my way to get my paycheck when that happened and my paycheck instead of going to pay catch up my car payment and my child support payments went to bailing my car out of car jail right. and so now I got to catch up again and it was a never never ending battle but when you're in that place and you're weighing out those decisions sometimes it's mighty tough and you'll face that test pay your tithes I promise you, yeah. it'll pay off. Yeah. Seems yeah. impossible. So now getting back to what I was talking about. When we moved into this place, I'm in that place. I have no money and I got rent due. And I'm barely eating right now. We're doing the macaroni and cheese and top ramen thing. And I've got a wife and a daughter. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't know what to do, but I know I'm paying my tithes and offering. Amen. So I paid that. And we're barely scraping by. And someone approaches me in the church says, brother, I'd like to take you and your family out to dinner. Would you like to do that on uh, Monday? I said, absolutely, I'd love to. So they take us out to dinner and I was just thrilled to get something beside macaroni and cheese and top ramen. And this particular person happened to be blessed pretty financially and uh, took us to a really nice steakhouse. Good. Say, get whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think nothing of it. I was just like, okay. This is the blessing right here. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to have a steak dinner. It's been a while. Yeah. So we ordered. They took care of the meal. And at the end of the meal, they start telling us this story. And the story went like this. They started telling us how this bank got a hold of them or this bank sent them a check. And they said that they had never banked with this, check, or with this bank before. And so they called the bank. And they talked to the bank and they said, I've never banked with you. I don't know why you're sending me a check for this money. And the bank said, well, our records show that we owe you that money. So we sent you that money. And the person was like, no, I'd like to send it back to you because I've never banked with you. I think you've made a mistake. And the lady on the other end of the line said, please keep the money, do whatever you want with it because it will be much easier for you to just keep the money because our records show that we owe it to you than it would be if we took it back because then we got to go through a whole big old ordeal to account on our end for the money. And so she said, do whatever you want with it. 
So that's when this person gets to the point and says, I prayed about it and I felt like God told me to give it to you. And so it was enough that I could pay the tithes and offering on it, the rent, and put real food in my refrigerator. And all I was trying to do was live for God and follow after God. And here he is pouring out blessings because I'm willing to pay the price to get into what the work of God and do what God is asking of me to do. And so that was one of the many testimonies that I can talk about. I remember when I first got in church, this is not my testimony, but this was a testimony that told, was told to me by a missionary and it stuck out in my head for years and I'll never forget it. This missionary was a missionary to Brazil. And this missionary said they were having a um, week-long conference down there and it was pulling in all the churches from all over the country. And they were, I can't remember the city they were in, but they were having Holy Ghost blowout kind of church. And they were praying through um, the, what do you call them, people that practice black magic, the um, voodoo and all that. They were, they were praying those kind of people through to the Holy Ghost and God was pouring out in a mighty way. And it was one of the sisters from the church she came into the service one night requesting prayer for her because the next day she had to go to the doctor to find out how she was doing because she was having serious health issues and she had already had one kidney removed and she was going in because her other kidney was failing and she needed to find out she was waiting desperately to get on a transplant list so that she could uh, get a transplant and get the kidneys that would save her life. And so she asked for prayer because she wanted an opportunity to get on that list a lot quicker because she could tell that her faith or her, her health was failing her. So they anointed her and they prayed. She went to the, the doctor and she came back that night to service with this testimony. She went to the doctor. The doctor started running tests. Well, it was the doctor that she had already seen that was already well aware of her situation and where she was at. And he comes back and he said, I had to go back and check the records because I wanted to make sure that I was remembering things right. He said, but we removed one of your kidneys, right? And she said, yes. And I'm here to find out if I can get on the list for the other kidney to get my kidney transplant. And he said, ma'am, you don't have to worry about getting on that list because not only did your kidney get healed, but you have two perfectly good Woo! kidneys inside of your body. And that stuck out in my mind for years because this person had enough faith to go forward and ask God to move upon their situation and trust God would move in that circumstance in a Holy Ghost filled service and went forward and in faith they prayed unto God for help. And not only did he heal the kidney that she had, he gave her the one that had been removed from her body. Now tell me that isn't impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Another testimony, my mom was there. She was at Brother Buxton's. Now, I have never seen this, but I'm waiting for the day that I will because I believe one day that I will. But a man walked in and he was blind. And he walked up after preaching and he went down to the altar and he prayed and he got touched. He got filled with the Holy Ghost and he walked out seeing. Amen. God healed him in the service. And I believe there's a day and an age coming when I will be in a service and I will watch a blind man walk in and he will not be able to see and have to be led to the altar and he will walk out of his own good two feet without anybody guiding him because he can see perfectly good, perfectly clear. Because God is able to do the impossible. So my question is, and my challenge is, what is it you're believing God to do in your life? What is it that you believe God can do for you? And what is it that you believe God can do for someone that you're praying for? Amen. God is moving in the faith realm right now. And God is trying to speak to somebody in the situation that you're praying for. It is no accident that God wanted me to go back into this. It is no accident that he got into the faith mode before service started moving. I believe God's got great things in store for this congregation, in your families, and in your lives. Oh, I want to open up these altars and give you an opportunity. If you feel something in your spirit, if there is faith building inside of you, I want to encourage you right now to come forward in faith and reach out to the almighty God that can do the impossible. Because he is the person.
possibility in the realm of impossibilities. Hallelujah. Jesus, have your way, O Lord. Glory to 